It's time for the first round of the playoffs versus the Washington Huskies. Why is their offense so potent? Where can the Washington defense be tested? And most importantly, will Texas secure a trip to the national championship? After the show, Inside Texas is the best place to stay up to date with the Longhorns. Insightful pre- and post-game analysis, non-stop recruiting updates, and the latest team info is dropping daily. Subscribe to InsideTexas.com today. Link in the description. Texas and Washington both face a team that could exploit some of their weaknesses. So will it be a high-flying shootout or a grinding display of physicality? Who is going to leave New Orleans Monday night with their ticket to the final round? Without further ado, let's get into it. The Washington offense is a problem. There's really no way around that. Kalen DeBoer and Ryan Grubb have created a dangerous offense that marries their elite skill players with their dominant scheme. Continuing their offensive success from last season, the Huskies are 8th in the nation in points per game, 4th in yards per play, and 6th in points per drive. And the man that operates that killer offense is veteran 6-year senior, Michael Penix Jr. Penix has really been able to settle in this year due to all the returning components of the offense. He's seeing the field at a high level, he's comfortable with experienced teammates, and he has the reps to diagnose defenses pre- and post-snap. That's led to another high-performing season, posting 9 yards per attempt, good for fourth if added to the Big 12. A third-best 66% completion percentage, paired with a conference-leading 33 touchdowns. Penix has an unorthodox throwing motion on top of being a lefty, but it works out for him. The first thing you think of with the Washington offense is their explosivity, and we'll get to that. But it's most important to stay on schedule, and Penix is doing that in the short game. He's able to pick out his read pre-snap and deliver time and time again. And this death by a thousand cuts allows them to go deep, but also beat you moving up and down the field. He's the second ranked short passer if added to the Big 12. Intermediate, he's able to isolate defenders, layer the ball over the second level, or time a receiver sitting down in the zone, while also being patient for crossers to develop on the opposite side of the field. He's the third graded passer between 10 and 19 yards. And now we have the aspect of the Washington offense all the talking heads are fixated on. The deep shot. Penix throws 20 yards plus a lot, 21.5% of the time, the second highest in the league. He leads the entire country in deep shots with an insane 100 passing attempts at this range. That's 15 more than the next guy. He's generated an impressive 14 touchdowns from this range, but it's also where seven of his nine interceptions come from. His elite arm strength allows him to put the ball on a rope on those fades, deliver that deep crosser, or rifle it in at the center of the field. Penix has so much faith in his receivers, which he should, it does allow him to get a little lazy with his progressions, and he can just assume Odunze is going to come down with it no matter what, even when there was a better throw that would have been lower in the progression. But even for this spamming of the deep ball, he has a solid completion percentage at 44% from 20 yards plus. When such a significant portion of your output is downfield, you have to be efficient holding the ball while the play develops, and Penix does that. It's incredibly hard to get your hands on him in the pocket with an excellent 9.1% pressure to sack rate. He'll take a free runner to the chest to deliver the ball. He'll sidestep incoming pressure or saunter out of the pocket to extend the play to the sidelines. His pocket feel and calmness in the face of danger is what makes this offense even tougher to defend deep. Penix is first and foremost a pocket quarterback whose strength is his arm, but he's not a statue either. There's a few times per game he will use his legs to make a play, and if you decide not to respect his running ability at all, he can pull it on some key downs. Penix is just a good damn quarterback that has had some shaky performances here and there this season, but ultimately finds a way to succeed if he's not outright dominating you through the air. Overall, Penix is the second-graded quarterback of 20 if added to the Big 12. But while Penix has been awesome, it would be foolish to not attribute a significant part of his success to his elite receiving core. First in targets with 125 is the outside threat, Roma Dunze. The 6'3", 215-pound junior is the all-around number one receiver package, able to generate yards short, intermediate, and deep. 
He's my favorite receiver in the nation with his special ability to win one-on-ones. Whether that's by flat out beating the corner or finding a way to work back to the ball and win those contested matchups. He'll make DBs look stupid if they can't locate the ball in the air. Overall, he's the first graded receiver if added to the Big 12 and sixth overall in Power 5. Second in targets is the Texas native Jalen Polk with 92. And he was the third option last year behind McMillan and Odunze, but he had to step up this year when McMillan went down with injury. The six foot two, 204 pound Polk is positionally flexible, playing out wide 60% of the time and in the slot the other 40%. Polk does most of his damage at the intermediate range between 10 and 20 yards, where 40% of his targets originate from. He can find space over the middle, hit you on the opposite sideline on a crosser, or win the old fashioned fade ball. Overall, Polk is ninth of 53 Big 12 receivers. Third in targets is the 6 foot 1, 192 pound junior Jalen McMillan with 46. And he would have been that first or second option, but he went down with injury for a majority of the season, only returning the last week of November. Washington is a pain in the passing game without McMillan. With him on the field, they become a nightmare. The dynamic slot can generate yak due to his quickness, with his six best yards after catch per reception. They utilize his speed in the screen game, and he can get to his spot quickly on stick routes to convert those third downs, or he can always just match up with you one-on-one on the slot fade. But due to him being out of rhythm with the injury, he's ranked 26th of 53 receivers if added to the Big 12. And that makes up the dominant three options that take a majority of the shine but there's still several other options Washington has at their disposal. You can go with the 6'3", 248-pound tight end Jack Westover with the fourth most targets. He can slip out on fake blocks or just sit down for the first down. He's super reliable, leading the conference with an 83% catch rate. Overall, he's 10th of 18 Big 12 receiving tight ends. Fifth in targets with 41 is slot Jeremy Bernard, able to threaten you in the screen game with a 4.540 time that allows for a 10th ranked yards after catch per reception. If you want to add a little bit more size, sixth in targets is the six foot four tight end Devin Colt. He's the first graded receiving tight end if added to the Big 12. And finally, a seventh receiving option. Yes, a seventh receiving option is yet another super fast slot in Giles Jackson. He's missed the majority of the season with injury, but he's back in action and ready to burn DBs with 4-3 speed. So you've got a top quarterback, an insane cast of receiving talent, but there's also another major reason for the passing game's success, the offensive line. Overall, they rank third if added to the Big 12 in unit pass blocking efficiency. Most impressive is they have only given up five sacks on the year. Left tackle Troy Fautanu ranks fourth. Center Parker Brailsford ranks 6th, and right tackle Roger Rosengarten ranks 7th. That's three starters in the top 10 out of 91 pass-blocking Big 12 linemen. But the guards do struggle here, with both ranking 59th or worse. The Washington running game isn't their offensive focus, only rushing an average of 28 times per game for 128th in the nation. This naturally blunts their rushing yards per game, but just looking at that would give you a false impression. The per play numbers show a solid run game on the ground. Averaging 4.5 yards per rush is good for 40th in the country with an impressive 7th ranked rushing success rate. So when they do decide to run, it's effective due to teams being freaked out by their passing attack. It's not an explosive run game though, ranking 89th in the nation for rushing explosivity. The junior Dylan Johnson is the lead back by a mile. The 6-foot, 218-pounder has 201 attempts on the season with a slightly above average 5.5 yards per carry. He's most dangerous falling poolers on man schemes to get outside, and he has good patience waiting for that to develop, with the ability to get to speed when he does see daylight. He can also gas you on zone when the offensive line eat up their assignments, letting Johnson to go untouched up the middle. This allows for Johnson to have a 12th ranked breakaway percentage, so he can get loose a few times per game. And he's physical enough to take on defenders, but doesn't escape those engagements often enough, with a slightly below average yards after contact per attempt. None of Johnson's numbers are in a top tier individually, but he's sound everywhere with no gaping holes in his game. All that put together, Johnson is the 6th ranked running back overall out of 28 backs if added to the Big 12. 
Up front, we've got a Joe Moore Award winning line here, but that was generally awarded for their success in the pass game. Their offensive line yards per rush is only slightly above average, ranked 52nd. And they struggle on short yardage when teams expect the run, with a really bad 94th ranked rushing power success rate. Washington supplements this by motioning runs to the outside or direct snapping to the backs to generate an extra lead blocker. Center Parker Brailsford does an impressive job, ranked as the second best run blocker if added to the Big 12. But then there's issues with the remaining four starters all below average in run blocking out of 87 total offensive linemen. Overall, this is a tough offense to slow down due to that team chemistry returning so many guys with NFL talent. Their passing attack is the best in the playoffs, and they'll put stress on any secondary in the country. They've had some off games where they sleptwalked versus worse teams, just like Texas, but they always found a way to make the winning play to remain undefeated. The Texas rushing defense is stout, and Washington isn't dominant on the ground, but they are able to scheme runs and take advantage of light boxes trying to cheat to their receivers. Don't get arrogant and assume we can dominate them on the ground when you have great coaches across the field with a month to prepare. But on paper, Texas does have a huge advantage here. The pass rush should be more focused on disrupting Penix however you can. But Texas likely won't generate many sacks versus this quarterback's play style with a great pass blocking line. Maybe you send heat to speed Penix up, but that takes a defender away from the pass. The Texas pass rush shouldn't be a major factor here as Washington does have the advantage on paper. And Washington most certainly holds the advantage in the passing game. With so many vertical concepts crisscrossing all over the field all the time, it's really tough on defensive backs. But it's most important to watch the sidelines. A ton of their big shots are simple fades or catching crossers right before they go out of bounds. Squatting corners in a zone should help, but our team isn't great with in-air ball awareness and Washington's receivers excel in contested situations. Texas is vulnerable, ranking 86th in defensive passing explosivity, and Washington naturally exploits this. It'll be interesting to see how PK plays this because he did well slowing Penix in last year's matchup. The Husky offense overall is ranked 6th in the advanced metric OFEI. A great offense certainly, but not yet in that elite top 3 tier. They've had three games this season where they scored 24 points or under, so Texas does have an opportunity to throw off their rhythm. The most important matchups are actually situational. The 12th ranked third down Washington offense versus the first ranked third down Texas defense is going to be key. Texas is also fourth in red zone defense and Washington underperforms here comparatively as the 49th ranked red zone offense. So now we see why the Washington offense is the strength of their team undoubtedly. But the Huskies have improved on the other side of the ball as well. But before we hit the defense, the sponsor of today's video is Prize Picks. Prize Picks is a skill-based daily fantasy sports app where you can make college football player projections all season long. How does it work? You select two to six players and choose more or less on their prize pick projections. It could be passing yards, rushing yards, receiving yards, and more. And if those players score more or less than their prize pick projection, you can win up to 25 times your money on any entry. Just hop on the prize picks app or website, go to the college football tab, and check out the player projections. It's a smooth process where you can make your entries in 60 seconds or less with fast withdrawals. It's that easy. As a first-time depositor, use promo code TEXASHOMER and you will receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100. That's double your money up to $100 for your first time. So sign up for prize picks, use promo code TEXASHOMER at sign up and add even more excitement to your game day. Link in the description. The Washington defense does well limiting points per game, ranking 44th, allowing an average of 23.6 points per contest, which is good in context because they are on the field way too much, ranking 108th in the country in opponent plays per game. The Husky rushing defense struggles down to down with the 70th ranked opponent yards per rush, giving up 4.3 yards a carry. Teams can move the ball consistently on the ground with an awful 129th ranked defensive rushing success rate. The interior has struggled versus the run with the 132nd ranked defensive line yards per rush and a 92nd ranked defensive rushing power success rate, so teams are able to pound the ball as well. 
This is usually worthless when Washington is up, but this could play a larger role if they are trailing. The only top half interior run defender is tackle Tuli Latuli Nasanoa, ranked second if added to the Big 12. The remaining rotation at nose and tackle are performing 38th or worse out of 57 Big 12 interior run stoppers. On the edge, there's also a lack of productivity. Early round NFL edge Braylon Trice does pretty well, ranking 15th. And rotational end Voy Tanufi barely cracks the top half at 29th of 59 edge run stoppers. The linebackers do have far more production, though, with three linebackers in the top half. Mike Edofuan Yulafoshio ranks 6th. Rotational Mike Carson Bruner ranks 13th. And Will Alfonso Tuputala ranks 21st of 49 Big 12 linebackers versus the Rush. The secondary does decent holding up on the ground with several top half guys, but no one is in that elite tier. They're a physical group and they do trigger on the ball well. Free safety Asa Turner is 18th if he met the minimum snap requirements. He's dealt with a ton of injuries this season that kept him off the field. Strong safety Dominique Hampton is 28th. Corner Jabbar Muhammad is 38th. And opposite corner Elijah Jackson is 47th of 110 run-stopping DBs. The Washington pass rush has some dudes, but they're 110th in the nation in sacks per game, only averaging one and a half. And that's particularly weird because you'll see they get a ton of opportunities due to teams having to throw against them so often. The interior pushes the pocket but doesn't convert often. Tackle Tuli Latuli Nasanoa is the only top half starter ranking 22nd with 8 total pressures and no sacks out of 55 pass rushing big boys. It's actually the edge where they can test you. Braylon Trice is an absolute beast on the outside ranking 1st if added to the Big 12 with an incredible 70 total pressures, six of which are sacks. He's an elite mix of size and athleticism at 6'4", 274 pounds, and he flashes on tape constantly, paired with his unrelenting motor. On the opposite end, the 6'4", 254-pound Zion Tupuola Fatui ranks 12th, with 24 total pressures, four of which are sacks. Washington fans are also really excited about Zach Durfee finally being eligible to play. We don't have any data on him due to the NCAA's archaic transfer rules, but it will be interesting to see how they integrate him into the pass rush after not playing this season. What's also interesting is how little they actually send their linebackers on the pass rush. No one in that room meets the minimum pass rushing requirements. And the same goes for the corners and the safeties. But they do utilize their Husky position, their version of the nickel Mishael Powell in the pass rush, ranking 7th of 15 DBs if added to the Big 12, with 8 total pressures. In pass coverage, this Washington defense sees the most opponent passing attempts in the country, averaging 40 passing plays per game. So naturally, that totally skews their passing yards per game number, making them look bad at 118th in the country. But similar to the Texas secondary, that number is misleading. Down to down, they are 23rd in the nation in yards per pass, 55th in opponent passing success rate, and 7th in the country in defensive passing explosivity. So don't overlook this unit with surface level analysis as teams need to pass more to keep pace with the Washington offense. Plus, they're ninth in the nation in interceptions per game, able to capitalize on desperate teams over relying on the pass. For the starting corners, Jabbar Muhammad ranks 17th with 10 PBUs and 3 picks. But the opposite corner, Elijah Jackson, is bottom half at 30th with only two PBUs and zero picks out of 50 coverage corners if added to the Big 12. Jackson is the corner you want to target most often. For the safety grouping, Nickel Mishael Powell is sturdy in coverage, ranking ninth with three interceptions on the year. Starting free safety Asa Turner doesn't meet the minimum snaps, but he would rank 12th if he did. And strong safety Dominique Hampton ranks 14th, pulling in two interceptions. Washington has solid performing depth here as well, with Cameron Fabiculanen and Vincent Nunley in the top half of 59 coverage safeties if added to the Big 12. The Washington defense gets overshadowed due to their offense, but I like this unit's toughness, and the narrative that Washington is soft clashes with the reality on tape. They don't give up a ton of explosives ranked 16th in the country, and they have a respectable 45th ranked defensive points per drive while facing a ton of plays. 
Overall, Washington is the 27th ranked defense in the advanced metric DFEI. And the keys for the Texas offense. The first move is Texas is going to try to control the line of scrimmage and see if we can grind them down in the run game. Texas isn't an elite rushing offense, but has a respectable 25th ranked 4.9 yards per carry and has been able to find success even down our starting running back. How does Washington handle 12 personnel in a more physical style? That's yet to be seen, but I do bet the Huskies come with something to prove. Then it's time to let Ewers take it to the air. These DBs are lucky enough to have faced elite receivers in practice often, so they won't be shell-shocked by the Texas receiving talent. But being able to keep the game close and balanced, they won't be able to sell out to the pass like they so often have this season. Ewers had one of his better games versus Washington last season, and it'll be fun to see how he performs in another big game with a month to prepare. Texas can't rely on field goals versus this team and needs to punch in touchdowns. The Washington Red Zone D is ranked 69th, but the Texas Red Zone offense is ranked even lower at 90th. That'll end up mattering a lot. People are assuming this game will be a shootout, and I can see it going that way. But since both teams have constantly heard the Texas pass defense is in trouble, and Washington's not ready for Texas to be physical, I can see the script being totally flipped. Texas does successfully limit Penix, but Grubb finds a way to get some runs on Texas. The Washington defense does commit to stopping our rushing game, and then forces Quinn into passing downs. I don't really know how this one will play out, and that's why I'm excited to watch it as a fan. Now that we know who and what to look for, it's just time for the Huskies and the Longhorns to meet head-to-head to see who makes it to the championship this Monday night in New Orleans. Thanks for hanging out. Watch some more of my videos here. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and share if you want to support Quality Texas content. As always, hook on.